So I'm going to be talking um, about two things that interest us hugely. Inequality, which you know all about because of this lecture series, and then happiness, which is uh, something that interests me enormously. So you've all probably been to a number of talks where this speaker, a very self-assured, stands up and says, let me tell you the truth. Now, let me tell you how it is. Let me tell you what we know and, and you know, the, 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 the ultimate theory of everything. Well, this is not going to be one of those talks. Okay, what I'm going to give you here is a presentation in which I'm really not sure what the answer is. But I do know why I don't know the answer. Okay, so this is what I'm going to concentrate on the reasons uh, I, th I, th I think we, uh, the things we think we need to know in order to answer the question of the relationship between inequality and happiness. So, Let's get going. Well, we just said we just said those things. So, what is the relationship between inequality and and measures of subjective well-being or happiness or satisfaction? I'll get to those in just a second because you may not know exactly what those are. Uh, this is my. I spent ages on this yesterday, uh, thinking uh, I did actually because it's word. It's, it's a bit of a disaster. Um, and I thought, well, what might the relationship look like uh, between uh, inequality on the x-axis? and some measure of global welfare that I'm going to imagine is a subjective evaluative uh, measure on the y-axis, what might this look like? Well, as we know, everything in economics is concave, right? I mean, this is just true, right? And there's no point in arguing with this. Everything is concave. So I thought, well, look, this is probably concave as well. And there's probably some kind of bliss point I star, I called it, in a moment of inspiration, which is the best possible level of inequality we can have in a society. Um, and of course, then the question is, well, what's I star? And actually, where are we? And subsidiary questions are, are what is inequality and what's actually welfare? But other than that, this is a very well-defined concept, right? So I thought, OK, this is probably... This is probably hump shape. There's a maximum. Fine. Now, why do we have this hump shape? Um, just very simple terms. Um, because of probably incentive problems at low levels of inequality. Um, and and this, is, this is contentious, actually. You know, should we all earn the same amount? And you know, there's nobody jumping up here and saying, yeah, what a great idea. Um, though actually, given that you probably earn Luxembourgish salaries and I'm paid in France, um, it's quite a good idea, actually, isn't it? Um, anyway, uh, so, so you know, there is th this, this idea of incentive problems. If we all earn the same amount and we're in a productive economy, why should I actually bother doing anything? Why should I bother contributing? I mean, I'd, I'd like to... I'd like to read books and go for the aperitif at four o'clock every day and go swimming. And I, I think that's, you know, essentially a fairly good use of my time. But it doesn't really produce anything. It doesn't pay for my salary. So once we get too close to equality, there's very little incentive to actually produce anything, which means we can have a, a, a very equal sharing out of what turns out to be a rather small pie. So that's, that's kind of no good. Though I, I will come back to that, and this is actually an issue with the experimental economics where money is not deserved, it's just distributed. So I just give you money for no reason whatsoever. And if you're getting money for no reason, then it should be equally distributed. OK, but in the real world, uh, we think there's incentive problems and then there's issues with fairness at uh, too much, uh, when there's too much inequality. So if I can hold the size of the pie constant, um, so that we are sharing out something that's fixed and doesn't change with the level of inequality, well, then probably uh, inequality does reduce well-being because of, because of fairness issues. And we have the well-known uh, concept of inequality aversion for a given number of dollars. We would like those dollars to be distributed as equally as possible um, holding uh, the number of dollars constant, of course. So it's really, really that simple, except it's not. 
right? And this is where it's all, it's all going to go horribly wrong very quickly. Before, we, before I tell you why I think it all goes wrong, um, our two key variables here are um, income, inequality, uh, which you, you know what that is. Actually, you probably don't. Um, and I don't either. Or rather, we do. We know how academics measure it. But I don't think we really understand in a particularly good sense what is perceived as being unequal or unfair in society. And that's, that's something I'm actually going to come back to. Um, and subjective well-being or happiness. Uh, now, I, I spent 25 plus years working on satisfaction, happiness, well-being, mental health measures. So I'm kind of all cool with them. I think they're pretty good. Um, you may well be much less accepting. So let me uh, firstly show you what they are and then give you a couple of reasons why you should probably take them seriously. Um, they're very simple. And um, this is the questions from the British Household Panel Survey Understanding Society. Um, how satisfied are you with your life overall? I mean, it's really a six, seven, eight word question. Very, very simple. And you answer on a one to seven scale uh, with these labels from not satisfied at all to completely satisfied. And you can ask that about your satisfaction with your job, with your health, with your income, or one of my favorite variables, how satisfied are you with your partner? I think that's something we should spend more time on um, <laughs> in many senses of the word. Um, so. That's the BHPS measure. Um, as you may know, in the UK, I'm British, by the way. Um, in the UK, we remember David Cameron for a number of things. Um, not all of which we're going to talk about today, right? Um, but one of the things we remember him for, reasonably positively, is introducing the uh, measure of subjective well-being into national surveys. Um, as, as of 2005, this was put forward and that these have appeared in national happiness surveys since 2010, I believe. Now, how satisfied are you with your life? How happy were you yesterday? Anxious yesterday? And did you uh, feel the things you do in your life are worthwhile? So various measures of well-being. Um, so these are very simple. They're very often single item which drives psycho uh, psychologists and psychometricians mad, which is a good thing, right? Um, because, you know, um, they're simple. No, nobody doesn't understand them. You know, if I ask you how satisfied is with you, are you with your life, nobody says, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. You know, well, what do you mean by that? Uh, we have like one person out of 500 doesn't answer that question, as opposed to asking you, how much do you earn? And then no one answers. You know, it's like none of your business, dude, or I don't know, or something like that. So with life satisfaction, we've actually got a fairly complete data. So that's good. It's simple, it's complete. And actually, in a sort of philosophical sense, um, this is democratic. I'm asking you do you, are you, do you like your life? Do you think you live a good life? And your, your idea of a good life may well be listening to 1980s hair glam rock music. And, and eating cheese sandwiches. You know, I've got no argument with that. You know, this is absolutely fine, whatever you want to do. Or it may be doing something completely different. Whatever, you know, what, whatever floats your boat, as we say in English. I'm not deciding for you what the good life is. You need to be employed. You need to do these kinds of holidays. You need to have this level of income. You need to live in this kind of area. I'm not top-downing, paternalistically defining well-being. I'm letting you, just every single one of you, decide what it is that you enjoy in life and then whether you've got those things that are important for you. So, super stuff. Simple, morally defensible, and um, everyone answers the question. It's also valid. If you ask me how happy I am, and then you ask Francisco how happy I am, he's going to say, yeah, he's a pretty happy guy. And I am a pretty happy guy, so, you know, that's good. We, could, we have cross-rate of validity. What I say will be validated by what other people say who know me, or indeed what other people say who don't know me, like the person who interviews me, or what other people say who don't know me and don't even see me. So if I play you a transcript of my interview, you will give a happiness score that's quite similar to the one I gave myself. And this is arguably 
something that is um, evolutionary fit. The fact that we can understand each other. Paul Seabright has written some really good work on this. We need to have a language in which we can understand each other. If I say I am happy, I have to be able to communicate that to you and you have to be able to relate uh, to that and believe it. Okay, so um, this cross-rater validity. We also have physiological and neurological evidence. If I say I'm happy, I smile more and I frown less. If you take measures of my, what's happening in my brain using blood oxygen level dependence, where the blood's going in my brain, um, I'm right-handed, so you'll find there's more uh, blood going to my left prefrontal cortex than to my right prefrontal cortex, which means I'm more approach than uh, go away, which means I'm evaluating positively the situation. So happiness scores are correlated with what we call left right brain asymmetry measured in the prefrontal cortex. It's where you evaluate, um, evaluate situations. And this asymmetry in the brain is associated with physiological measures that we think, <laughs> we think actually, this, Conchita and I wrote a paper on this and it ended up being a little bit more complicated than we thought, is correlated with cortisol production and if any of you have done this, measuring cortisol is actually rather difficult, and with uh, CRH, which are stress responses. So happiness is, is correlated with what's going on in my brain and with what's going on in my body. So it seems to be some kind of holistic measure of how well I am doing. And following on from that suggestion, it actually does a good job of predicting my future health outcomes. You can predict uh, stroke, suicide, coronary heart disease using the cross-section distribution of well-being. Those of you who are less happy today will live less long. So I can actually, so cheer up, right? <laughs> so uh, I can actually make a good prediction of who's going to die. And um, this, this, is, this is a fantastic piece of work. Dana et al. in the Journal of, uh, um, uh, journal of um, uh, something in social, personality and social psychology, um, taking textual statements from nuns when they joined convents in the 1930s, having those textual statements re-examined using a textual analysis technique, looking for positive, negative words, blah, 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 in 1985, using the resulting score to predict whether those nuns were still alive or not in 1985. So this is a 55-year difference, and it works. It works. You're positive in 1930, you're alive in 1985. And that's obviously not an omitted, it's not a reverse causality kind of thing. And this is um, also one of my favourite papers, this, though I don't think we can do this in the lab, unfortunately. Um, a paper by Cohen um, asked all of you your life satisfaction scores, then take the cold virus, as you do, spray it up your nose, measure you three days later, those of you with higher life satisfaction scores are less likely to have caught a cold. Okay, so this is really picking up something about your entire health. Okay, and that, that, is, that prediction of health outcomes spills over to all kinds of other outcomes, uh, predicting um, quits at, uh, in the labour market, predicting effort at work, predicting reciprocity, um, and in general, well-being scores are well-behaved. The people we think are doing well are the people who actually turn out to be doing well. So those are those, you know, good health, having a job, being in a partnership, being a woman. Uh, you know, let's see if you get a chance. That's a good thing. Um, higher income. Yes, you know, so I designed this for Luxembourg. Um, don't have kids, by the way. <laughs> It's too late? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, and um, uh, the midlife crisis, the midlife crisis comes out extremely clearly. Um, so I'm on my way up, right? <laughs> the, the low point's around 45, something like that, 45, 45, 50, and I'm just over 45, so yeah, that's good. Right, so these subjective well-being measures, they sort of make sense. 
They, they pick up the things we think they should pick up. They behave the way uh, we think they should behave. And our question then is well-being well-behaved with respect to inequality as well. We sort of think inequality should reduce well-being. Does this actually uh, work? Now, I thought this was the world's most stupid question uh, some years ago. This is absolute no-brainer, but of course... Of course, inequality is a bad thing. Of course it is. We, we know that intuitively it's a bad thing. And uh, I've changed my mind about that. I don't think it's quite so easy anymore. The simple way of looking at this, and this is, the, this is probably a sort of gut feeling about distributions, is that, as I say, everything's concave. Uh, well-being's no different. It's concave in income, so an extra $1,000 matters less for someone with 200,000 than for someone with 40,000. It's decreasing marginal utility of income that we all learnt in uh, Microeconomics 101 all those years ago. And our social welfare function is some transformation of individual utilities. Uh, then greater income inequality reduces social welfare because we're taking money away from people for whom it matters and giving it to people for whom it matters less. So bad idea, okay? That's, that's the sort of simple take on, um, on this question. And, and, and that's it, game over, right? That's, that's the way a lot of people think about this. That's all there is to say. But it's, not, it's really not that easy. Um, partly because this inequality is a social phenomenon. It's not like other aggregate variables. It's not like inflation. Inflation is a thing. You know, it's a thing that we all suffer from or, or enjoy if you've got a fixed rate mortgage, actually. I mean, bring on inflation, yeah. Um, inequality is not a thing. It's actually a set of relationships between individuals. That's the way it's constructed. So as such, it's a social phenomenon is defined by how I fit in relative to you and how you fit in relative to everyone else. And the definition of inequality is when some individuals receive different incomes than two others. So firstly, we can have a dispassionate view on this. By dispassionate, I mean I'm not concerned. It's not my, you know, I'm not there. I don't live in Luxembourg, but I can still have, a dis uh, still have an opinion about the distribution of income in Luxembourg. I can think it's too wide or it's too narrow. Uh, we can have, all of us have, uh, except the Brazilians amongst us actually, damn, this doesn't work, I should have changed this. Um, you can have an income about, uh, opinion about income distribution in Brazil. And all of us can have an opinion about historical income distributions. We think, oh, they're too wide, they're too narrow. You know, that's a good thing. I'd like that to live in that society. That's a bad thing. I wouldn't like that. That's the dispassionate approach to um, income distributions. And then you may well, as a result of that, say there's too much or too little income inequality and we'll uh, come back to this. So we've got two things. The dispassionate evaluation and the fact that any change in income inequality will change my income and your income, okay? So it's two things. But we're not finished yet, and this is where it gets really messy. We also live in the societies in which the income distribution changes. So any change in the distribution of income affects my income, okay? Affects your income, but it also affects my income relative to your income. It makes me rich, but it also makes me relatively rich. Or it can make me rich and make me relatively poor as well. You know, uh, a rising tide doesn't float all boats here. We can all get richer, but relatively poorer. It depends where those changes in income are happening. Okay? So what matters here is not only how much I get, but how much I get relative to all the other people to whom I uh, compare in order to evaluate uh, my income, what we call my reference group. So we think, I mean, we, you've got to have it, I'm an economist, I've got to have an equation, right? Otherwise it just doesn't work. 
Uh, so here's my equation. Uh, v equals VV uh, uh, as a function of YI and YI ref. So YI is, um, let, actually let me do that, that's better. Uh, YI is my income, V is some kind of indirect utility function or something like that, how well I'm doing. And YI ref is the income of the people to whom I compare. Okay, so if you ask me, is my income good? Then I think, how much do I get relative to, you know, relative to some other group? My parents, it could be my parents, it could be my brother and sister, it could be Conchita. Conchita moved from Italy to Luxembourg. She had no idea how much my well being went down when that <laughs> happened. You know, I was relatively poor. Um, you know, this kind of thing could be anyone, but this, this is something I will come back to who's in the reference group. But in general, just, just bearing with this idea for the moment, an increase in income inequality that makes you richer makes me relatively poor. An income, increase in income inequality that makes me richer makes you relatively poor if you compare to me and I compare to you. So there's a whole sort of mess here about who's getting richer and who's getting relatively richer. And that means that when we take all these three things together, we've got the change in how much we as individuals earn, the change in how much others earn to whom we compare, uh, and, and then we need to know to whom we compare as well. Do we compare to everyone? Do we compare to the richer? Or do we compare to the poorer? Do we compare to only people who are very close to us in some sense, who look like us? And this, is, this can give you any kind of movement whatsoever. It's um, in some sense over-parameterized. There are so many things that matter here about which we know nothing that it's very hard to say anything definitely, definitively, sorry, in, um, in, in, uh, in, in sort of general situations. So that's the comparative approach to income inequality. It doesn't matter how much you earn, it matters how much you earn relative to everyone else. So my, our summary, because this is work I did in a handbook chapter with Conchita uh, uh, three years ago now, um, taking all of this at face value, uh, what do we have? Inequality rises. Well, that's bad for marginal utility of income reasons. Okay, that's distributing from the uh, uh, poorer to the richer, and that reduces marginal utility of income, so and reduces utility. Then we have this dispassionate evaluation, um, which might be negative, might be positive. We don't know. And then we've got this hugely ambiguous effect that comes out through comparisons to others, which others, how much, and so on. So if we put all of this together, we, we really have no idea. It's really, there is no general statement we can make about inequality and happiness. Uh, you'd need to parameterize all this for me and tell me who's getting more, who's getting less. And this is actually something I'm gonna come back to. We talk about inequality um, inequality rising, and we've all got this Robin Hood idea in mind. Oh yeah, higher inequality, that means taking from the poorest and giving to the richest. And, and most inequality movements don't look anything like that. Um, I think, I, I've always thought this, but I don't know why. Most inequality movements are sort of faffing around in the middle of the distribution. That's, that's where all the sort of action happens. And it's actually difficult to know um, whether people think of that as being uh, more or less inequality. Okay, so where are we? We've got these three things. It's a huge mess. It would all be much, much simpler if we didn't compare to each other, okay? If we didn't have a comparative sense of income. So let's see if we can just kick that out. What evidence do we have that income comparisons matter? If, we, if, we, if income comparisons don't matter, we're kind of home and dry, and it's simple. So let's, let's see what we can say. And unfortunately, it ends up, we can say rather a lot about this, and most of the work does conclude that income comparisons matter. We can take a happiness approach. Uh, this is a nice paper by Erzo Lutma, where we can look at my happiness that I report, my income that I earn, 
And then the income of the people who live in the same metropolitan area as me, so Puma. And I never know what that is. That's something, something metropolitan area in the US uh, survey data. Um, and I sort of promised I wouldn't use too many regression tables, but uh, here's one anyway. Um, my happiness goes up with my income and goes down with the income of my neighbours. And for those of you who are of a statistical bent, you will notice that these two numbers are the same statistically. Okay? So what does that mean? I mean, I'm saying that because it's a fun thing to say, but I'm also saying it because it's actually rather important. That means if we all get richer, no one gets happier. Okay? So this is the Easterlin paradox in micro data. I get rich, I'm happy. You get rich, I'm less happy. Same thing for you. Economic growth serves no purpose. Okay. That's uh, a quite broad comparison group, people in the local metropolitan area. Here's a really narrow one, something I did some oh, 20, 20 plus years ago now, looking at my happiness as a function of my pay and the pay of my partner the person with whom I live. And what you can see, whoops, what you can't see here, because I forgot to show it to you, is my happiness goes up with my pay and goes down with my partner's pay. So the more my partner earns, the less happy I am. Um, that's a very local comparison. Okay, so that's the happiness approach. Not everyone likes happiness data. So what other approaches can we take to show that income comparisons matter? We can ask people hypothetical preferences. Which one of these islands would you like to live on? The one where you earn 50 and others earn 25 or you earn 100 and others earn 200? Prices are the same in both islands for those people who do macroeconomic equilibria and things like this. Uh, so we do insist on that in these surveys. And individuals say that they prefer A over B. And to be clear, what that is saying is I've got a preference for status over dollars. I will trade off actual dollars for being richer than you. Okay? And that's what people say. Um, so maybe we don't believe that, but it turns out that that's what they do as well. Um, in experimental games like the ultimatum game, I won't have time to go into details of this. The ultimatum game, I'm given money, I propose to share it with you. If you refuse that sharing I propose, the money disappears. If you accept it, you get what I propose to you. Now, subgame perfect Nash equilibrium that we all know and love, what should I do? I should propose you one cent or a small amount of money and you should say yes, because people come along and they're saying, have some money, to which you say, thank you, and you take it. As it turns out, in, um, in laboratory settings, and this includes in field laboratory settings, propositions of under 25% of the total amount are systematically refused. So I offer you $4 when I've got 20, you say, no way, and those $20 disappear. So there's no way of understanding that except via a concern for fairness or relative outcomes. Uh, this holds with $4 in the US. It holds for extremely large stakes. Um, the work that um, Henrik and Ernst Fair did, that's a Foundations of Human Rationality book, um, even when you're proposing things that are days or weeks salary, people will refuse unequal outcomes. Okay, that's experimental. Um, perhaps the most striking example of this taste for status is an experiment by uh, Daniel Zizzo and Andrew Oswald some 20 years ago now. Um, a normal kind of experiment where you're given money, you play, you win, you lose, this kind of stuff. Uh, and at the end of the experiment, an unannounced second round where you can take your earnings and use them to burn other people's earnings. You have to pay for it. It costs you money. Okay? And this is uh, Andrew, who was my supervisor, says this is one of the only uh, experiments he knows where they had to call security. 
so it got a bit out of hand at the end. Um, and the average subject had half of her earnings burnt, so you thought you'd earned 40 bucks, and you actually end up leaving with about three because all your earnings were burnt. So half of all earnings burnt, if I could translate that into the real world, we would be willing to destroy half of GDP for a more equal outcome. I mean, this is strikingly large figures. Those are experiments in the lab. Um, I don't know if I had time to talk too much about this. Natural experiments in the field where you find out how much other people earn. And sometimes this is not very good news for you. Um, so a natural experiment here from a court decision that made the salary of Cal State employees public knowledge. You can still go up and look up all your favorite Cal State professors. Um, it's on the Sacramento Bee website. Um, find out how much David Card earns, things like this. You can absolutely do it. Um, the experiment was to inform half of employees at three University of California campuses about the existence of this site. So it's an intention to treat model. Some of you get an email saying, do you know you can find out how much your colleagues earn by clicking on this button, you know, clicking on this link. Others of you don't get the email. Follow it up uh, a week later, two weeks later, do, 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 some days later. Follow it up with a survey of everyone, whether you got the email or not. What you find out is the people who got the email are unhappy. The people who got the email are more likely to be looking for a new job, and the people who got the email are actually, some evidence they're statistically more likely to quit. Now, get, get the results straight here. They're not quitting because they're low salary. They're quitting because they know they're low salary. They just found out. So the comparison here is someone who earns X thousand dollars who got the email with someone who earns X thousand dollars who didn't get the email. The treatment is knowledge, is finding out you're low paid, and that's a bad thing. Okay, let me finish on my uh, experimental evidence here, and uh, I've still got about five minutes left, so I should be okay. Um, neuro. This never works, this slide, by the way. I'm, going, I'm leaving. <laughs> I've had enough. Oh, no, I want to see. <laughs> I've seen this talk before. It's not very good. Um, can you see that there are blue dots there? Yes. <laughs> All right. This, this never works, usually. So this is a nice, a nice piece of work by a mixed group of economists and neuroscientists at the University of Bonn, um, putting two people in MRI scanners who accidentally meet in the waiting room. Of course, it's done on purpose that you meet your uh, compatriot in the uh, waiting room for, for this experiment. You're put in separate MRI scanners. You hold your head still. You look up at a screen above you. You see these dots for one and a half seconds. They go away. Then you see this screen, 24, less or more. How many dots did you see? Fewer or more than 24? You've got to say. You choose, pause, you get the feedback. If you get it right, you get a tick and you earn some money. If the guy, these are all men, in the other machine gets it right, he gets some money as well. What you can mess around with here are these two figures. Here, the other person earns more than you for getting it right. You can set up a whole series of conditions, what they call conditions, uh, of which C6 to C11 interest us, where both people get it right. In these conditions, you can see contrasts. Contrasts are where you hold your own earnings constant, but other people's earnings change. C6, C8, C11 are contrasts. Everyone's getting it right. In the first, you're earning less, the second, you're earning the same, and the third, you're earning more than the other person. What's going on in your brain while this is happening? Well, we measure what's going on in your brain by a bold measurement, blood oxygen level dependence. You see where 
the blood is going in your brain in the same way as if you're doing pumps with your arms in the gym, the blood goes to your arms. If you're evaluating things in a part of the brain, the blood goes to that part of the brain. And particularly, we look at the ventral uh, striatum here to see how much the ventral striatum is working. So what we find is that C6, where you weren't less, is evaluated less well than C8, which is the same, evaluated less well than C11, where you earn more. Remember, you're earning the same amount in all of 6, 8, and 11. Okay, the only thing that's changing is how much the other guy in the other machine is earning for their guess. So that when you, I mean, all of this work we look at with happiness scores and comparisons to others, it's not just talking the talk. You're really walking the walk here. This is what your brain is doing. Your brain is doing this evaluation comparatively. We are comparative animals and presumably we can tra trace this back to what was happening uh, on the savannah six million years ago where the fastest runner got the meat and the uh, you know the uh, leopard with the most attractive pelt got the mate this kind of thing we are comparative we are still comparative the question of whether that is an evolutionary fit now is a good one but it certainly seems to have been evolutionary fit in the past so income comparisons exist any evaluation of inequality will include a comparative element we know much less about the normative evaluations of inequality. So this is evaluating distributions in which you do not appear. I'll just give you a couple of little factoids here, one of which is mediumly interesting and one of which I think is totally devastating. Um, the first of this, uh, the first of these is the uh, evaluation of the outcomes of the hypothetical grandchild. So which society would you like your grandchildren to live in? Would you like them to live in society A with a wider distribution or society B with a narrower distribution? If you can do numbers here, you'll see that these have the same expected outcome, both of these, but one, so it's a mean preserving spread. A is a mean preserving spread of B, okay? Which society would you like your child to live, grandchild to live in without knowing how able your grandchild is? Um, oh, sorry, that's not true. Expected income is higher in society, excuse me. So we're trading off expected income for inequality. And we find um, a significant amount of inequality aversion in these experiments that people have a taste for narrower distributions at the price of uh, some kind of expected income level. So we can, we can evaluate how much people value uh, inequality in, in this way, in a dispassionate way, because they're not in these income distributions. Um, the second one, and I think this is, this, is, this is absolutely devastating for a lot of the work uh, you do. I mean, you work on inequality. I'm, I'm, I'm golden here. This is not my problem. Uh, but th this, is, this is kind of terrifying. Um, what do people understand by the word inequality? Um, you know, the Pig Dalton. Prince, uh, transfer principle. If you transfer money from uh, a poorer to a richer person, inequality has risen. I mean, do people agree with that? Um, so here we are, a verbal experiment. We're taking money from a richer person and we're going to give it to a poorer person. Does that reduce inequality? 40% of people don't agree with that statement. They don't think that reduces inequality. That's not what they understand by inequality. So they don't agree with Pickle Dalton. So that kind of screws the genie to start with. Of course, this is, this is words, and people don't understand words. So let's put it in figures. Here are two income distributions. Which of these is more equal? And of course, Pigu Dalton, you're transferring from richer to poorer. Here is that transfer, 4, 7, going to 5, 6. Obviously, by a Pigu Dalton transfer principle, B is a more equal society. And fully two-thirds of people disagree with that. 
They don't think that is true. So the work we do characterising income inequality in societies, in distributions, may well be using measures that just don't resonate with what individuals understand by equal or unequal income distributions. I mean, it's, it's, quite, it's one of the most striking things I've seen in social science, this finding. This is, what, you know, this is the basis of what we think inequality is, and it doesn't work. People don't agree with it. OK, so what is the sum total of all of these things then? Own income, comparison income, normative evaluations. Um, we did a literature review, uh, probably four years ago now, um, of the results of income uh, uh, well-being estimations of this kind, where you uh, relate my well-being to my own income and to the degree of inequality in the society in which I live, um, and to see what, what the data said. Let's take it to the data, as we say. And uh, what happens then was the data said no. Uh, the data doesn't really understand what's going on either. Um, so we, we looked at just under 30 um, of these kinds of uh, analyses, about half give you a negative relationship, so people are less happy in more unequal countries, given their own income. Uh, five made it positive, six made it zero, uh, one couldn't actually decide. <laughs> What's going on with that one? Uh, and in the last one, it actually turned out being positive and negative at the same time. Uh, it really just depended on your specification. So this is hugely, hugely inconclusive. The data uh, doesn't know either, and that's really unsurprising if um, we think that this correlation is going to pick up a whole bunch of stuff, the comparative effect and the dispassionate normative evaluation of distributions of um, well-being. So I'm almost done, but what I'm going to do is finish with a couple of notes, um, and we've talked about some of these, so this will be quite quick. Um, the first is that, following on from the Amiel and Cowell thing, maybe the Gini just isn't a very good measure of distribution. It's not the most apt one. It's not the one that people think of. They think of something else when they're talking about inequality. And we should do more work comparing the distribution measures. Um, secondly, and I think this is gigantic, fairness and perceptions, we're talking about the observable distribution of income. We're not talking about whether that observed distribution is merited. And that's really what a lot of the current unrest is about, that this distribution of income is thought to be unmerited or indeed is not even perceived in the way that we objectively measure it. And, and what people think other people earn is a long way away from what they actually do earn. And if you think you're better than the man in the street, this is actually quite good fun. Try, try this, the OECD compare your income tool and see how badly you get it wrong. We just don't know. We don't know what the distribution of income is in our own countries, I, I, I swear. OK, lastly, we're, um, not, not lastly, but almost lastly, uh, we need to know to whom we uh, compare. And we've been talking about comparing to everyone in general. I don't think that's true. My gut feeling is we compare up. We look up to people above us. We don't look down to people below us. And that's got all kinds of implications for what kinds of distributions of income are going to be associated with uh, uh, more or less happiness. And indeed, we may well be altruistic with respect to some people where we're happy when they earn more, just to add to the complexity. So I've looked at uh, just well-being as an outcome measure. This is a whole industry, and it's really quite a lot of fun, actually. Um, other outcome measures are correlated with uh, inequality, agreeableness, so more unequal societies are less agreeable people are less agreeable, they trust less, uh, they vote less, political participation falls, uh, there's less support for globalisation, which is something we've been talking about recently as well. Um, positive correlation with murder and violent incidents, as you probably know. Uh, and this is also one of my favourites, self-enhancement. 
positive correlation with self-enhancement. So with self-enhancement, I have to write this down because I keep on forgetting it, um, you're given a list of 20 desirable personality traits. I'm trustworthy, I'm good-looking, I'm fair, things like this. And then you're asked, do you think you're more or less so than the average person? Okay? For these 20 personality traits. Now, this was asked across 15 different countries. In 14 of those 15 different countries, the average person is more, uh, you know, is more trustworthy than the average. Okay, so that, that's, in, that's true in, in all countries bar Japan, interestingly enough, where the Japanese do themselves down. They think they're less good than the average. So this, this idea of thinking you're better than average is positively correlated with income inequality. And um, I think lastly, and this is also a fun piece of work, uh, female preferences for male facial masculinity. Uh, you may not know, indeed I didn't, that there are masculine faces for men. It's to do with the distance between your eyes and the ratio of this to this and this kind of thing, whether you've got a masculine face. And women prefer masculine faces more in more unequal uh, societies. Right, and the last thing I've got to say before Louisa kicks me out um, is all of this empirical work is terrible. It's, it's of really poor quality. Uh, and it's not necessarily conceptually of poor quality, but just empirically, it's, it's awful. Um, partly because it's hugely underpowered. So you're looking at inequality in Belgium compared to inequality in Spain, right? You know, there's, there's tons of stuff that differs between Spain and Belgium that's uh, independent of it, you know, that's other than inequality. Okay, so you use time series. Well, that's no good either because Gini doesn't really change over time. It's remarkably stable. So you're hugely, hugely, hugely underpowered. Okay, we've got no statistical power here. And even worse than that, nobody, but nobody, takes causality seriously. So they'll say something like, oh, there's more murder in unequal countries. Like, okay. You know, what's causing what? There's, better, there's worse health in more unequal countries. I mean, I totally agree with you, but that's not a causal statement. This could entirely result from the quality of the educational system, producing poorly qualified people and people who don't take good care of themselves. So they're correlated, there's no causal. What you need is an exogenous movement in the income distribution of which we have barely any in this world. And one of the only ones I know is um, work on support for the minimum wage. This very nice paper by uh, Kuziemko and co-authors that came out four years ago in the QJE. But in general, all of this work that is a mess anyway, conceptually, turns out to be pretty messy empirically because of low power and no exogenous movements in income distribution. So really, there's very little we can certainly say about this we need to do more work on it for sure, uh, and there's no doubt that feelings of unfairness matter. Uh, I don't think we've got the right objective measures. I don't think that people perceive those measures, even if they're the right ones, which leads you to wonder whether we need a policy for redistribution or a policy for the perception of distribution. Do we need a policy for media? You know, tell people things are actually better than they think they are. And lastly, if comparisons make us unhappy, can we learn to compare less? And that, that is actually a genuine research program that is being uh, trialled in UK schools as I speak. So thank you very much for your time. Sorry to have run over. Thank you. Yeah.